Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. What's up, rock and rollers? Yep, it's that time. It's time for another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show. We talk about all things exciting. music, motivation, and success. These are the things that drive us and inspire us. If you hear that, if you're not watching this on the YouTubes and you're just listening, that guy in the back, yeah, he's a persistent part of my life. 17 year friendship. Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy voiceovers.com. Jim, what is happening today? Who are your guests on your podcast today? Music, inspiration, and sports. Sometimes, I never I've been talk a about. Lot of, I've been I asking never a lot about the sports questions lately. Never, I know. Never. I know. I, I, we've been watching football lately, so whenever I, uh, some of our guys are from you know uh, Dallas, and then they wear the Cowboys, and I'm like, oh hey, let's yeah, talk too about bad. That, but. <laughs> yeah. um but i'm good so, man how are sorry, you sorry sorry yeah no, I'm, I'm, dude, I'm great i'm just i'm just happy that we got out of this snow apocalypse you know we were talking about uh we're just been double downing on the podcast trying to get like tons of episodes in the can now while the year's a little bit slow before i have to go ride the tour bus and do all that stuff and we just got hit with snow and ice and i thought i did my due diligence doing my shopping and stuff by the end of that week i've been trapped in my house man i'm getting cabin fever we ate everything in the pantry I mean, even those like disgusting like canned beans and stuff that you buy just in case there's like oh, yeah. a nuclear war yeah yeah, yeah. Over about the from pasta? COVID. <laughs> did you cook okay. all the pasta uh you know what i try to avoid it because it's just like eating like a giant loaf of bread but you know you got to do what you got to do man you know plus right. my girl is you know she's half italian which is a strong gene it makes you all italian so um luckily she's dominant a dominant gene it is a dominant gene you know <laughs> and so who is that that you hear ladies and gentlemen i'm so excited about this it's so long overdue because i met this uh fantastic drummer in 1997 when i moved to nashville but hailing from the lake geneva area of these united states he's called nashville home since 1989 fantastic drummers played with the likes of clay walker lonnie mack ezra mohawk just to name a few but majority of time you can catch him down keeping the ball moving down the court for country music at the famous roberts western world i'm talking about my friend maxwell Schaff. max what's up buddy Hey, Rich, yeah. what's happening, man? Good to see you. It is great to see you, you know, even virtually. We got used to this whole thing during COVID. Jim and I did 60 episodes in person, sitting right here, sometimes a whole band sitting around the table. Yeah, I remember. It, I've seen seen some a bunch of those where it, it was all in studio. Yeah, we need to get, days. we probably need to get back to it. You know, Jim's got a nice space down there that he's doing his thing. And then we're like, during COVID, we're like, let's keep this thing alive, man. It gives us a purpose. It gives us you know, something to have deadlines for. And we, and we just, I think we did like 80 episodes. Well, all the episodes since, and we're up to 164 episodes, but wow. Max, you're long overdue, dude. You know, when I see you down the lower Broadway, carrying the torch, um, you know, for traditional country music, I'm like this guy, fantastic musician, super affable, super approachable, super nice guy. Of course, I see you down there wearing your Pearl snap shirts. There's always an upright bass player, you're shuffling your butt off your train beating your butt off man i just always but i never get to visit with you because yeah i know it's know, always like five minutes here and there where i'm running back to the stage on a break or something like a hug you know if i can get yeah. in the place you know and i show the the velvet rope guy my id and he lets me in and then i hug you and then i'm trying to belly up to the bar to try to find a place because the place is the word is out the right. place is always slammed, and I'm just trying to get myself some crinkle fries and a and a course original. Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah, well, we're we're actually playing uh, afternoons now every other weekend in the afternoons, and it's a great shift. Much much nicer, less drunk people, less crowded. Yes, better tips. It's, it's great. Now, it's really when you good. say when you say we, is that your band Brazil Billy? Brazil Billy, yes. Tell us about Brazil Billy. What is the history there? Because it is a staple of Nashville culture. Brazil Billy has been playing there for probably over 20 years. I haven't been playing with them that long, maybe 12 or 13 years. Yeah. But it's dedicated to definitely old country, 40s, 50s, 60s, maybe a 70s song once in a while, and trying to play it kind of like the records were back then. So yeah. I'm not not trying to overplay uh, I feel very blessed that I get to play a gig that is mainly triplet bass music. Well, it's like, a thing it's of the all past. Shuffles, <laughs> it's all swing. Yeah, uh, we do a lot of Western swing. I get swing drum solos. That's kind of a rarity in Nashville. Well, yeah, because you get to go right into your Krupa. You know, your Krupa. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, 
and you're great at it. You know, you, you obviously, I mean, this instrument is just a little over a hundred years old. You know, we owe it to our American art form jazz and you have complete control over the triplet. And there's a lot of people that just, I mean, I do a lot of teaching and there's guys that come in, they literally cannot get the subdivision of a triplet because there's no more, you know, bad, bad Leroy Browns on the radio anymore. I mean, right. everything is, I mean, I almost take offense when I go to sit in, usually I've had a couple and John England will say, come on up, Rich. And uh, uh, he throws me all these straight eight things i'm like i can swing dude oh you know, yeah he's... i've heard you swing you can definitely swing oh man. my goodness but he goes like yeah let's get let's get him like a like a 1950s rocker or something you know yeah. <laughs> but the band like johnny be good oh yeah don't they know that oh that but and then originally <laughs> the funny thing is is in the early days of rock and roll like chuck would be playing straight eights and then the rhythm section would be swinging because they didn't know what to do oh yeah i love that feel i love that tension it's just a wonderful feel and it yeah. so made sense too. That's it. Yeah. Tension. Yeah. That's man. the that's the role in rock and roll. Yeah, man. So that's the role. Yeah. Yeah. So now you let's take us back a little bit because to have that kind of command of the instrument and more than anything, know you know your history of music. If you're playing music from the nineteen forties, fifties, and sixties, yeah. There's a lot of people that haven't gone, you know, past some forty one. You know what I mean? It's like there's right. so much music out there, right? I so, definitely had to woodshed a lot when I got this gig because I did not know all all the old Marty Robbins and all that stuff. You know, yeah. I had to definitely had to woodshed it and learn somewhat the style, but definitely the songs and trying not to overplay them. Yeah. So now, I definitely woodshed it a lot. You consider yourself a song drummer? Absolutely. Yeah. Try not to get in the way. Isn't that what Nashville's about now? Maybe Nashville's, not on your gig, but <laughs> no. Well, the funny thing about my gig is, it's still, it's, 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 um, it's a cartoon anime version of a stadium rock drummer, like a, like, a, like, like Max Weinberg, but playing in right. a band with a steel guitar. Still got to stay out of the way. It's just really loud. Right. Yeah, but, yeah. But you're still playing tasteful. You're still yeah. playing the song, but it's got the rock energy. Yeah, man. So, do yeah. you do you like playing? Um, the lower volumes you know? i'm enjoying it now yeah, i yeah. haven't had a, a lot of gigs that were steady that were like a low volume gig it's yeah. it's interesting it's uh nice i've been practicing playing my bass drum with my heel down trying to get that thing happening and the feathering thing yes. on the swing tunes and uh it's fun it's challenging it's made the gig really fun Interesting what you say it, that about yeah. playing it heel down. I mean, do you kind of feather the, 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 do you bury the beater in the head or you kind of. Sometimes, boom? mostly I pull it off. Depends. Yeah. Okay. It depends what I'm doing. I can get a lot of, I can get a really good force and volume out of the pedal. I play yeah. a, a speed Cobra pedal and it gives a lot of leverage. So it's just, the it's Tama? just a, yeah, it's just a matter yeah. of building your muscles up to be able to do that. Yeah, I bought a new pedal not too long ago, and it came with the rubber, like cone-shaped beaters. Oh temp, yeah, yeah. I guess put on the, and it's weird because it it bounces, it, re yeah, it, it yeah. rebounds, and it's yeah. like so you get the boom, boom, you know that that kind of effect. Yeah. yeah, if you have that, you got to pull off. Uh, yeah. Feathering would be like feathering is pulling off the bass drum, never burying, but you're playing at such a low volume that only the only thing you're doing is adding a little bit of articulation to the upright bass player's note. Right. You're supposed to feel yeah. it, not hear it, but it then you know, reversely, if you play a big, gigantic, twenty-six inch, wide open, bottom bass drum, you got to pull off that. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to get the. It's just going to thud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Get that buzz. Yeah. So I didn't know you were originally from Connecticut. Yeah, I'm from Milford, Connecticut, and Jim is from Bridgeport. Danbury. Danbury, Connecticut. Danbury. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What about you? So, uh, Wisconsin. Yeah, I can hear yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, that is cheese, baby. That oh yeah. yeah, there was no country western up there when I was. Are you there. are you in the host band? Uh, <laughs> the host band, yeah, the host band. <laughs> what is that, Jim? What oh yeah, it's that's the uh, you know the the Wisconsin accent. Oh, the yeah. oh, so you are with the little guy, yeah. Right. Oh yeah, yeah, the house. You yeah, gotta absolutely. go to the house and get the mouse. Like that, yeah, they gotta. Speak like that, you know. Yeah, no, yeah. but you know, it's not. It's not super thick. I think the South evened you out no. a little bit. Yeah. No, no, no. There's that. There's a tinge of it there. Yeah, yeah a tinge of almost, it. Almost, yeah. almost like a Philadelphia kind of feel to it as well. Mm. Oddly enough. Well, I can uh, kind of slip in and out of it when I need to. 
You know, I can kind of, I do the Bill Clinton and I actually oh, get yeah. in the character with the thumb yeah. and I did not have sexual relations with that woman. And that's pretty Ms. good. Jim. Yeah. Thank you. Jim does a Christopher Walken. That's pretty good too. Oh, you know, I've right. been working on my Morgan Freeman. My oh, Morgan Freeman. Voice of God. Andy Dufresne was not meant for, was not long for this prison. Yeah. So you, they, you just watch Shawshank a, over and over and over. His feathers are far too bright. That's one of that's one of those movies for me, like Ridley Scott's Alien. That if that sucker is on, no matter where it is, I'm watching <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah, even that's when you well, know what's coming, it's still great. He, Shawshank yeah. is the one that makes you cry, Rich. Right? Oh yeah, when he goes and he sees his friend at the end in Zawataneo, and he's coming uh, up on the beach, and they friend. got their whole life ahead of them as best friends in a paradise, and they don't have to asked P. You know what I mean? They could Don't just go spend too the, far. You're going to get for Clemt. They're buddy, they could just spend the rest of their lives enjoying the sun and their friendship. And my, what I imagine is like climbing trees to get coconuts and then all the native women in the rum and sounds great. Sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> no, Maxwell. <laughs> Maxwell. Three, I think this is crazy. I don't even want to laugh about it because I know I think one of them was Walter Hartman, and I don't know if it was John McTeague, but I think three drummers fell through the glass window at Roberts. Oh, uh, it was only one guy. It was a guy Just named one. Stan. Yeah. Oh, oh Stan was the guy. Walter's yeah. safe. John McTeague is safe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now they replaced the glass with plexiglass in the back. So I think we just bounce off now if we lost our balance, and hopefully it's bulletproof. bulletproof? Too. Yeah, that's what I was really? hoping. Hoping. Oh yeah, yeah. That would be great. The thickness. That would be great if it was bulletproof. Yeah. So I forget when that was, but um, yeah, that it was, was just quite like, a while ago. Yeah, like eight years ago or something like that. Yeah, he uh, fell out, broke some ribs, wow. and finished the gig, and went across oh the street gosh. and did another four-hour shift. That with is broken commitment. ribs. Yeah, he didn't know they were broken at the time. Yeah, but that's got to hurt. You would think. Oh. He had a lot of protective cowboy gear on, a lot of leather stuff. So Did he? Getting back to what you said before about the shuffles and stuff like that and the yeah. swing, um, I just had, like I was talking about the Huey Lewis guys in here, right? Yeah. And uh, I've been, you know, every time I get in front of them, I'm like, I'm, you know, whenever you need a drummer, I'm your next guy. And uh, I was constantly just be a pest and plant that seed with them but anyway uh they said the song they audition drummers on two of them uh is um shuffles uh stuck with you oh yeah good dun, ga, dun, ga, dun, dun. that's a difficult song to play and yeah. a couple days off oh yeah 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 which one is that because that's a show uh, uh, all I want is a couple days off. God, God, God. He's doing like a slow hot for teacher shuffle. Wow. Right, so right. the both audition songs are triplet based. Are triplet based. Nice. Yeah. And it's funny because if you, have you guys seen the tribute, you know, Alex Van Halen has made it into the modern drummer hall of fame for this year, right? Oh, nice. Yes. Uh, right. And they have, there are three videos on YouTube right now. Uh, one is uh, with uh, Mike Portnoy doing his his tribute. Ray Luzier is yeah. one of them. Nice. And uh, the other one is uh, Jay Weinberg. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, doing their own tributes with the you know this just giving tribute to Alex. And uh, Ray does this exercise that he says you know how you can tell if your shuffle your bass drum shuffle is good is by playing those sixteenths over the triplet, the shuffle. Ah, and yeah. I, and, he, and he did the whole. I'm like that is. Wow. What do you mean 16th over the That's so, so duck -a duck -a duck -a duck -a like, on the feet? And then 16th in the hands? Right. Wow. Because they yeah, don't line up. You speed up. Like, yeah, you're voicing um, you know, the the shuffle more like a dotted eight sixteenth. That's kind of like right. a Texas shuffle feel too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Trying to get it closer to that than like just straight triplets. Yeah, my mind I, I saw that yesterday and I was like mind blown. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay. 
Yeah, well, I've done now, well, now that we're on the subject of shuffles, there's a million ways to do a shuffle. Even if you go back to the jazz ride simple pattern. So you got ding, da, ga, ding. Mm-hmm. But it could be jaga, do, da, go, do, da, go, do, da. Or be ding, dang, ga, ding. The space between the, the spang, uh, lang. And so the same thing with the shuffle. There's a million ways. And some guys like a nice loose shuffle. Some guys like a tight shuffle. Have you been micromanaged over the years with like very knowledgeable people that are like, hey, tighter shuffle, looser shuffle? That, 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 that. Uh, I I try to let it suit the songs. I mean, yeah. um, when I play blues, a lot of times it is a more of a, you know, dotted eight sixteenth. You know, dotted eights. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're doing double hand shuffle, a lot of times it's like that. Yeah. But have you ever uh, seen Jason Smay? play in nashville no he's a monster shuffle drummer he used we to just play had with Pete abbott on man he's a pretty good shuffle player. oh yeah 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 we gotta go see uh jason smay some n- monday night at the five spot he plays with this band called the tiger beats okay monster shuffle drummer so you got a traditional gotta... grip he plays oh, wow. a, a kick drum one cymbal a hi-hat and a snare he's a minimalist oh, simple swings the heck out of the band I love it. So, yeah. are we talking like a young cat that has got an no. old soul or an older guy? No, he's you yeah. know he's been around. He's a yeah, man he's, of a certain age. Yes, yes, Def- and definitely a certain knowledge. I love he's, uh, that. Would you yeah. say uh, vintage? Yes. You know the five no. spot. I got it. That's another really cool spot. Uh, no pun intended. That has just always got great music, like practically seven nights a week. Right. Yeah, it's well known for that. Yeah. To- so uh, do, you went to North Texas State, right? Did you? Yes, they just were. Yeah, Ed. So how did you get to there me? from Connecticut? Were you? Um, did you have to audition for that? Yeah. So my Connecticut journey was: I was there till I was eleven, which is about the ah. fifth grade, and then I moved to El Paso, Texas. Culture oh, shock. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah, we went wow. from like lots of white people overpaying taxes to lots of brown people eating tacos. And I was right <laughs> in the middle of all of it. And I could pass for just about anything. Um, but what a multi cool, multicultural environment. And of course, Texas has this amazing music education culture. So, yeah. um, th- so my first college degree was I went to Texas Tech and was a big fish in a small pond and got a lot of experience. And then when I was like, I got this, then I went to North Texas for my master's. And while I was there, I was like, I have to play drums in the one o'clock. I have to play percussion in the two o'clock. Somehow I made it happen. And um, I guess it's just, that was just kind of like finishing school, like figure out how to play these 20 page charts. And then you'll be able to play a three chord rock song with a click. Right, right. So that was wow. my journey. Who yeah, was but, uh who was teaching drums when you were there? It was Ed Sof. Yeah. Oh, Ed Sof, monster man, monstrous drummer. Monster. And I have to got to get him Just, on the podcast because I made the mistake, um, not on purpose, but my first teacher, Alan Shin, God rest his soul, we lost him about two years ago. I wanted to have him on the podcast and just you know for all time, kind of like capture our relationship and have a really meaningful conversation. And and he passed before I could, so. I got to get my other teachers on there. Henry Oxtell, um, uh, uh, Robert Chitroma, Ron Fink, Ed Sof. Those are the guys. Ron you know? Fink, yeah. Yeah, Ron Fink was, he gave me my greatest compliment. He wrote in one of my books. He said, uh, Rich, you're like a great sportsman, always hunting and fishing for the notes. <laughs> <laughs> I love Good it. Night. Thanks, oh, Ron. Man. So, who did you have some <laughs> some groundbreaking or uh, instrumental teachers in your life? Uh, I mean, I did go to college in Wisconsin for for music, and I was doing more percussion and everything. Took a lot of music theory courses, sure, which definitely came in handy when you come to Nashville. Yes, for your number I, charts. I, yeah, I found out that uh, Bach figured bass equals number charts. Basically. Yeah, figured bass is basically number charts. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, when I saw that, I mean, I was doing number charts when I was living in Cincinnati before I moved here. I did a bunch of country session work there nice. and uh, got kind of familiar with that stuff there, too. So wait a minute. Were they using number charts in Cincinnati? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's interesting that it has it's it has spread. It, you know, it does make total sense. It's efficient. It's a time saver. It's a great platform to get things done quickly. And yet, you know, um, in New York and L.A., you're still going to see a letter chart. Right. 
Yeah. Right. That, that's very mm. true. They're like, that's yeah. for the hillbillies, man. We don't need that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see him try to instantly transpose on a note chart. I know. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah that's the problem. Yeah. So what kind of stuff were you playing in Texas before you got here? So um, Playing around? You, you yeah, know, Texas, uh, you know, in El Paso, I was very, you know, involved with, you know, all region jazz and symphonic and marching and just was so involved with academic music. And I always had my own bands and such. And then when I went to Lubbock, it was the same thing every semester, you know, big band, small group, basketball band, the the symphony, the symphonic band, I was just playing all day, every day. And um, then when I got to Dallas, Dallas has a pretty robust music scene. There's steel yeah. drum bands and fusion bands and smooth jazz and horn bands and working big bands. And there's jingles and killer top 40 bands where I learned how to play with a sequencer and program my drum cat. And uh, yeah. we triggered cat, and all the stuff. Remember, I remember the first yeah. time I bought that drum cat, I was like, I am in the cool club, man. I bought yeah. the drum cat, you know, so just playing all sorts of different kinds of music. And then probably with like similar to you in Cincinnati, you kind of see this, a kind of a roof on a, an invisible roof on a ceiling where you're like, look at, if I really want to move the ball down my field in this career, I have to go to New York, LA or Nashville. Right. What was the impetus to pick up and move for you? Well, it's kind of a long story, but uh, I was playing like in a lot of funk bands up there. Yeah. And that was in the eighties and, funk stuff gradually became more and more program it did yeah one night i was listening to the radio and a ronnie Millsap song came on i said wow this is good this is really good and i started listening to country i auditioned and for and got in a really good house country band up there a six-piece band yeah and i did that for a while and one night lonnie mack the great blues guitar player walked in and he was just having a good time and sat in with us. And he and I seemed to vibe really well. Just had a good time together. And this creating an opportunity. I was smart enough to give my card, not to him, but his wife, who handles who handled his business. Ah, the, the my wife of Drew. Yeah. yeah, I just like, whatever, maybe nothing will come with it. Two weeks later, his band quits. The bells broke down out in L.A., his bass player and drummer, Nashville guys. I'm not going to mention names, but they quit. So he called me and got the bass player and I, a guy named Michael Freeman, fantastic bass player. And we had uh, one and a half rehearsals, learned all his stuff, and then we went out and opened for Stevie Ray Vaughan for <gasps> several weeks. Wow! Did you become pals with Chris Layton? absolutely monster drummer nice. monster shuffler really, absolutely supports the band very well great rhythm section got to learn a lot uh, watching those guys yeah and we were off playing everywhere and about a month after that we were opening for huey lewis and the news on the sports tour playing wow. huge arenas madison square garden everything like that what was your Madison Square gar Garden moment? Did you did you take the time to treat yourself to really drinking in that moment? Did you get well, a picture? Well, we played a couple nights there. We played one night, and then we had a a, a night off because the Shrine Circus was there. Yeah, and they stored all the animals underneath you know, the level underneath the stage. So you could go down there. Oh man, that smell! Ooh, oh god, smell. elephant poop. <laughs> that was bad. But. Uh, yeah, and, and then we played the next night, and it was sold-out shows all the time. It was uh, very interesting. Huey Lewis was a great guy. He yeah. put on a disguise and come out and play harmonica with us. And Oh, really? You know, people were looking at us, and who is, the, who is this blues band? What are these guys? So, yeah. It was interesting, though. Huey was great. The band was really great. Billy was a great drummer, man, just laying it down. I got to play one song with them, like the final encore of the tour. Yeah, and that was fun, but that, that was so. I went from just playing in a local band to touring with all these people. I mean, that was, and I, this you know, if I hadn't great... given if I hadn't given my card to them, 
I haven't given my card to the right person. It might yes. never have happened. This is a great, great lesson because when I was in Dallas, I always told everyone, I always showed up early. I was always the last to leave. My drums were always had fresh heads. They were cleaned. I was dressed. I was prepared because I was waiting for that fat cat to come through that front door with the cigar. Go, hey, kid, you got a great haircut. I got a group. They need a drummer. We're leaving in a week. That never happened. But for <laughs> you, Lonnie Mac came in, loved your shit. You 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 hit it off personally. And next thing you know, you're you have a professional relationship with it. It worked out for you, and that was your ticket to Nashville. Well, I'm I assuming. Was, well, I was with him about three years. Yeah. Uh he was recording an album and Barry Beckett was producing it. We went down to Muscle Shoals. Wow. Uh, Roger Hawkins was playing on s some of the tracks, so I got to meet Roger. Did you ever get to meet him? I never got to meet Roger. Now, Jim, if you don't, uh, if you're not totally up on this aspect of drum history, he was this. Um, he he was a session musician that played on the, the likes of um, "I'll Take You There" by the Staple Singers. What's another one, Max? Aretha Franklin stuff. Oh, the Aretha oh. Franklin stuff. Oh, really? Yeah. Sitting on the was dock he kind of like? Bay. Yeah. Did he play was in he respect, or was that Bernard Purdy? Uh, he played respect, I think. Yeah. Wow. Was he part yeah. of the Swampers? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Look at yeah. Jim just one upping us. Yeah. We, no, yeah. Uh, never assumed Roger that Jim was, doesn't Roger was a great guy. He at, between one of the songs, he 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 said, Hey, come here. He took me down a hallway, pulled open a locker, and said, This is the snare drum I played on respect. And I was yeah. just like, wow. Yeah, don't man. touch it. It was just a yeah, it was just a super four hundred, but the way of he course it was it. a super phonic, the most recorded snare drum in history. Right. I thought it was um, a black beauty, no? Well, I you know, I I prefer a black beauty, but I don't the super phonic might have it beat. I don't know. Yeah. Really. So Lonnie Mack was real insistent about getting his band to play on a song. Barry Beckett was against it, but he relented. We did one song. It turned out great. So we did another one down there. And a couple of weeks later, we came to Nashville and finished the record. Ah. So I got to play on, I don't know, about six out of the 10 or 11 cuts on it. Nice. So, now, what yeah, record was, was this, bud? We got to put it in the show notes. This was uh, Road Houses and Dance Halls. Nice. And it was on uh, Epic Records at the time he was on that. Yeah. Lonnie Mack really cool and so you got the bug you did you i got the bug i met yeah. you know barry beckett i've always admired him you know his, his playing i've heard his playing and production on rodney crowell records and yeah. just amazing cat and you know he was the muscle shoals piano player too for a long time and his son jim is the house drummer at the grand Ole opry yeah. mark beckett oh really now yeah. great drummer yeah yeah great drummer nice cat a nice yeah. cat man so uh, you know, I was playing, we were playing, uh, around all over the country and doing stuff. And gradually the gig started kind of tapering off and, you know, things just kind of run their course. You know how gigs do. Oh, yes. And, uh, some of my friends had started moving to Nashville from Cincinnati. So I had several friends that had moved here. That country band I was playing in, uh, four out of the six guys ended up moving to Nashville. So I thought... Hey, I got an in. So I was, but the, the, re, the thing that did it, I was rehearsing at my house in Cincinnati and this guy named Butch Baker, who was on Mercury records at the time and great guy. Uh, I'd known him from playing. He played up in Cincinnati. Some he call he was calling our bass player to offer him a gig. And here we go. Another creating opportunity. I told the bass player, tell him it's a package deal or nothing doing hung up the phone rang five minutes later and said okay we'll take you both i love so I it had, i had a so i had a a road gig before i even moved in nashville very very lucky very fortunate in that respect yeah it, is, it doesn't usually happen a lot of people were like hey i'll move to nashville if i get a job i was like you're not going to get a job yeah. until you move to nashville so that you know and i i moved down here and uh just stayed in the place that I'm at now, just took it over. Um, my buddy, the bass player, we both moved down here. Our total rent was three fifty a month. Each? No, one eighty seven fifty each. Nice. Oh nice. That's what nineteen eighty nine was like in Nashville. And now you're still in this house, you bought it. 
I bought. I ended up buying it. Yeah, just Amazing. too lazy to move. So wait, me. <laughs> you're you're saying it's not the same li- anymore? Well, I uh, I don't know how people afford to live here or to move here anymore. <laughs> I mean, it's so expensive to move here. Well, I a mean, starter home is, now is seven hundred grand. It used to be that's a, big, that's a nice starter home. It used to be two hundred, but it seems yeah. like a lot of starter homes now are seven hundred grand. I mean, granted, there is a lot of work for people. Most people that seem seem to be working a lot that move here. I mean, there's more stages and more gigs available all the time. Mm-hmm. But it's hard. You'd have to play a lot, a lot of gigs. You know, when I hear oh. the numbers, uh, I do hear the numbers. It's quite interesting. And this could be urban legend. And it really probably depends on the situation of the person. But I do hear that if you can position yourself correctly with the right bands at the right clubs on the right shifts and you are not afraid to work, you can make 100, 120 grand playing down a lower Broadway. But now uh, I've heard that that's possible. Yeah. How much work? And are we talking seven days a week, three? Probably. Probably. Uh, yeah. Unless you're in some place that just pays gangbusters. I would just think that would be you would be flirting on the precipice of burnout. Burnout and. What the what kind of physical damage are you doing to your body playing multiple four hours four hour shifts every day? That's true, man. That's difficult. That's very difficult. Yeah. What so is I, your I, schedule looking like down there these days? Uh, we play about every other weekend: Friday, Saturday, Sunday afternoon, and it's good. Pays enough, and it's fun. So that it's six ga- kind of six slowing gigs down. A month. Uh, with that act. Well, yeah, six days, yeah. Plus, we go down to Austin, Texas, to play every yeah. once in a while too. Yeah, and that's 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 fun too. You like you like Austin? You see yeah. yourself live? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a nice town. I wish yeah. I would have moved there twenty years ago if I was going to move there. So, well, but you're here, and yeah. this is this I'm is like it here. yeah, this yeah. is the music business. I mean, I right, right. people do all the comparisons between Nashville and Austin, but let's face it: the infrastructure, the publishing, the labels, the bus companies, the rehearsal. There's oh, no com- yeah. there's no comparison. Yeah, my w- motto when I moved here was whatever it takes to stay in Nashville. Whatever kind of crappy gig I'd have to do, I was even working for uh, a place that did bus conversions. I was driving cars through the auto auction on Wednesday mornings, you know, yeah. whatever it took. Those were to your day here. jobs. That's, you know, just part-time things, whatever yeah. it takes to stay here. Cause you don't want to be that guy that goes, Hey, I'm going to Nashville. Hey, see you guys later. You know? And then six months later, you're coming home with your tail between your legs. Yeah. You don't want to be, that be guy. determined to stick it out and persistence and determination. And well, so this is a concept you've brought up creating opportunities not waiting for opportunities to land in your lap but literally positioning yourself with places people circumstances to create opportunities for yourself it's a fine line between uh being too pushy and making sure that you can maybe put yourself in that slot it's a very fine line you know yeah. how some guys are around here they're just pushing you man rich get me a gig man you know everybody come on man Throw me something, you know? Yeah. It's crazy. I don't get to throw me some things because that just seems like really, really that's, that's pushy. But I, Germ- but I, German. but I, yeah, I get the, um, I get the, let's do the coffee thing there. You know, people are like, they like, they want to oh, pick my brain cool. and yeah. then, you know, to hopefully create a relationship. You know, the main thing is, is that I think you probably would agree. If you're new in town, you got to let people know you exist. And if you get some gigs, invite people to see you play those gigs. That's right. your business card is your That's actual true. playing. Playing gigs around town. Yeah. And did you have, were there still jam sessions going on when you moved here? Like country jam sessions? And My first jam session in town was at the Boardwalk Cafe on Nolensville oh, Road yeah. with Casey Letton. Oh, yeah. So Casey Lutton, and this is like a small little place. If you guys can picture this really smoky popcorn machine in the corner, you know, <laughs> well drinks for days, no menu, dusty little band is setting up in the corner. And, uh, you know, Casey has me up 
And um, it was a triplet. It was a shuffle. And he liked yeah. the fact that I knew the Elvin Jones, Chica Ka Chica Ka Chica Ka Chica Ka. Oh, He's yeah. like, oh, I don't hear that very often. And so then Casey and I kept in touch. He ended up becoming my cartage guy. So relationships wow. and action over the years, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but, oh, yeah. And there was things happening at the 16th Avenue showcase. It was like... It's a shoe store right. now on the roundabout with the naked people playing the tambourine right there. It's a, <laughs> it, there was, there was the 16th Avenue shoe. It was a, it became, a, it was a shoe store, but originally it was a nightclub and there was jam right. sessions there. So me, my graduating class in Nashville was me, Jim Riley, Pat McDonald and Lee Kelly. Man, good players. You remember that oh, little, yeah, little group yeah. of guys, man? Yeah, yeah. I used to go to country jam sessions, and yeah. I didn't get anything out of that, any gigs out of that. I used to go to blues jam sessions yeah. and get all kinds of stuff, not blues, like songwriter gigs and yeah. country gigs from a blues jam. I don't Where know were those? Why. Where were those? They were all over the place. Yeah. I mean, there used to be a place uh, next to the Exit Inn that used to have them, and there were just a bunch of places that aren't around now. Yeah, there was a but, place. That, it was like an Irish bar next to the exit in right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Irish pub or English pub, whatever. I used to play like little, you know, spang spagalang gigs there. Oh, yeah. And then I <laughs> swear that the guy behind the bar was a drummer. He used to play for Nancy Griffith. Do you remember the guy? Oh, I'm talking yeah, about? yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember his name, but. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, the willingness to go to jam sessions and connect and let your playing speak for itself and be, you got to have that business card. You know, I don't yeah. know if the crazy kids do the cards nowadays. We used to have the thing. I think anybody does. I know. Where you, where you would just bump the phones and then it would transfer oh, yeah. your information. That lasted for like a year. And then now what the kids do is, I guess, they ask for your number, they put it in the phone, and then they call you right on the spot. And then everybody right. has each other's information. Right, right. These, these crazy text you. That yeah. works too. That does work. Yeah. So, so, so with my trying to get in with this Huey Lewis in the news tribute back, back to the important shit. It. Okay. Let's <laughs> get go Jim this them. job. I'd like to see that. <laughs> uh, um, I, every time I get in front of these guys, I'm like, well, if you ever need uh, someone to p pinch hit, what do they I'm, say? Uh, I'm, I'm, well, you know, I think. Um, uh, you know, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's like I'm I being gurmy by doing that, but at the same time, I'm like, I don't really care. I'm not trying to make a career out of this. Well, it's Jim, just you have nothing to lose, buddy. You could just, you know, right. And that's exactly how I kind of look at it. You know, yeah. Well, what's but, the? I mean, you know, I, Jim. I, I, I apologize to the guy. I said, I'm sorry if I'm coming on too strong. I said I don't want to take the other guy's job, of course. But I mean, uh, this is uh, his his uh, you know bread and butter. Um, but I mean, you know, and a guy who holds down the seat, it does a great job. I'm always yeah. just saying, well, if you ever find yourself in a pinch, I should be able to, and it's also the Catholic guilt thing, right? So if they yeah. do somebody else, I can come back and say, well, I wasn't good enough. Really? What, what, I don't even get it. Uh, I don't even get an audition What the crap, man. Sometimes those opportunities just come down to being available. Yeah. You know, how yeah. people shift around gigs here all the time. They'll start subbing out their main gig and. All of a sudden, the leader yeah. will get, kind of get, you know, kind of a little ticked off about that. And you may go fill in just at the right time. And maybe the other guys just moved on to something else. And just being available used to be the thing, especially being available in the summer when everybody else was out touring. Yeah. Used yeah. To That's like the uh, my first night on like the air. That. They ever tell you that story, Rich? The first night I made it on the air and radio? Um, Maybe, you, but that sounds like a fun story. I uh, was getting my feet wet in radio. I was yeah. take I, the production guy would go home. I would go into his studio and just, you know, learn the craft, start taking apart all the different things, learning all the equipment. And a buddy of mine, um, back then he wasn't a buddy. I barely knew him. Um, they, somebody had called in, which, you know, shifted the shift down. So he was doing afternoons and his shift was the night shift. And ah. Uh, it came down to, uh, you know, him calling the boss. Okay. The guy who takes over after the night shift, we can't get a hold of him. And the boss said, okay, who's in the building? <laughs> it could yeah. have been the janitor yeah, yeah. for crying out loud. Just and uh, availability. My, and my buddy comes in. He's like, hey, you want to be on the air? I said, yeah, you know, eventually he goes, no, now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. You just got to get thrown into the deep end of the pool sometimes. And so you yeah, can't overthink yeah. it. You just That's gotta, what it was. 
You got to swim. And and yeah. you fell in love with it, right? Not the on air part of it. Yeah. I oh, mean, yeah. the you know, when I did talk radio, it was a different animal because you could be yourself. You could still be yourself on music radio doing the breaks, ins and outs and stuff like that. But it was a classic rock station. So, I mean, you're, you know, front selling and back selling, uh, you know, Led Zeppelin and Heart and 38 Special and all those types of bands. But it was like, you know, hey you know come on down we got you know comedy at the cookhouse on wednesday nights stay tuned for the latest from uh you know the beatles <laughs> you know and it was like okay this is it was boring to me you're perfect you know? for it though jim really you gotta that voice. was the job yeah yeah and that you was... had to be excited about every song like it was the first time you ever heard it yeah <laughs> here's a latest from led zeppelin whole lot of love check it out <laughs> damn i've never, never heard, heard this before you're like introducing yeah. the new song from Led Zeppelin. You're all oh, right. Buddy. Yeah. You know, we got a whole 40 minute long set of I-95 rock coming up, kicking off with a little Van Halen and a devil, you know, running with the devil. Yeah. Can't wait to check it out. Um, yeah. So Max, so, who's, who's, uh, is there a song? Is there a Tootsie songbook? Is there a lower Broadway songbook? That's what you know, I've heard. Not only know, a song book, yeah. but an actual school that you go to to learn the songs. They tell you that's what I've heard. That you, yeah, they but, teach yeah, you who's how running to this? be a front person. I don't know. Someone, someone, someone very in smart the higher and up enterprising. At yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they have, a, I've heard that they have a specific list of songs that you can play. Is interesting. And I'm sure there's a lot of Pat Benatar and Journey on there. Oh, you got to, and it's got to be very fast. And if you play a Jason Aldean song, it's got to be twice as fast. Anyways, uh, um, really? Well, it, no, well, just if you go down there and you hear any, they're so fast. They're just yeah. sing the chorus, drummers. Sing the chorus and lock. You have in to the listen. Tempo. You have to listen to the singer. That's one thing I learned playing yes. in this band. You really have to learn, listen to the singer. And if they're rushing their words or if they're barking the words, you're playing too fast. Yep. You got to give them time to breathe. Yes. So is it, I mean, they, they, they don't play have a faster than they can. List, but they're, they, they don't dial in a uh, click track or anything. They're not playing with a rhythm. I I'm think sure most guys, I, I think a lot of guys play with a click down there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I not at Max's gig do. because it's just natural. Like the singer counts it off a lot, right? Uh, right. Sometimes I use a visual click, just an yeah. app on an iPhone. Sure. I don't like the audio click because you just you get too locked in. It just sounds kind of stiff on country. And a lot of that old country stuff moved. Yeah. Like all Bob Will stuff sped Heck up. Yeah. All that stuff speeds up. Some stuff actually slowed down. Yeah. Different, different songs, you know, like shuffles and Hey man, Jerry depends. Croon on that uh fourteen carat mine, Gene Watson. Oh, that yeah, is yeah. a workout, dude. That's a good got yeah. it, got it, got it, yeah. got it for three and a half minutes. Oh my god. That's fast. Yeah. That was my intro that was my first job in Nashville was going to Japan and playing with Gene Watson. And, really? and the, those Japanese people love traditional country music. Man, they knew that's every cool. word to Farewell Party. They knew every word to 14 Karat Mind. It was crazy. Farewell Party. That's a great song. Yeah, that that's a really uplifting song, isn't it? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Jim, it's basically about um you know, we broke up and um, I bet you're really glad that I'm dead. And so we'll see you at my funeral. Uh -huh. It's like, ouch. I like a lot of the old uh, Buddy Harmon tracks. He did a lot of rockabilly stuff. I mean, he did, you know, Patsy Cline stuff, but he did a lot of rockabilly stuff. You can always tell him it's just smack and snare, really tight snare. It's just there's a song he played on. Uh, I don't remember who it's by, but it's called Boogie Woogie Country Girl. It's just yeah. straight eights and a pop and snare. But he did a lot of rockabilly stuff. That's, that's the first time I heard him is doing rockabilly stuff. Yeah. And, and I would see him like uh, in 97 when I moved here, you'd get out to the Opry and he would just be kicking it. He'd be hanging yeah. out at the Opry. Yeah. He's yeah. like a staple in the building. Right, right. I One of the most the, recorded drummers ever, uh, ever. Uh, like the John Robinson before John Robinson. Right. Yeah. I remember playing, the first time I played at the Opry was on the TV show live with Joy Lynn White, someone I'd never played with before. Yeah. The guitar player, Charlie White, had hired me for the gig. He got snowed in somewhere the day before. So Jeff King subbed on the gig. So I'm playing live with somebody I've never played before, just 
learn the songs and just go pick it and off and on that weird kit remember how the kit used to be set up for a left-handed or right-handed player yeah there's Back two right buddy was still yeah, yeah buddy was still the just that was that was kind of hard but it was, and the wedge at the time i remember this was going back 20 years ago the wedge you never knew it was going to come out of that thing right. it could be no vocal and all steel guitar which is all not going guitar. to help you it's Absolutely. not going to right yeah that is not going to help your cause and then as the years have gone by and then the popularity of loops came in because i used to play there all the time with pam tillis and then there were chad cromwell and greg morrow were programming some loops on her music and it was like she's like i want to have that and we're like well are we going to sound check is there going to be a how am I going to monitor it? You know what I mean? It's like, so it, yeah. it started to change. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You were here when things were starting to change for the better. Yeah. So <laughs> one more time, I created an opportunity. I got yes. I love this theme. Uh, soon after moving here, you know, I've been playing country and I really missed playing blues. I went, uh, went down to this, uh, place, uh, downtown and they had a blues band playing there it was called jamaica at shoey's now you know by vanderbilt close to the 16th with split yes yeah. and there was a really good blues band playing there without a drummer and for some reason i was impetuous enough to just bring my kit the next day it was like on a tuesday or something the next week they played i just brought my kit and said, hey, man, can I uh, play with you guys? You know, I don't want to get paid or anything. I'll just, you know, and it was kind of a quiet thing. You could play with brushes and blues. And they kind of looked at me weird. But since I had played with Lonnie Mack, they thought, well, maybe he knows how to play. They let me set up. They didn't let me play the first set. They let me play the second set. And then that started a long gig with it. It was a Bobby Taylor blues band. Wow. And yeah, it was just. And I played for free for two or three gigs, and I was happy. I was fine with that. Just brought a little tiny kid in there. It was fun. And then Max, they started demoing yourself. Dude, no. that was a great way to pitch I would, yourself. I would never have the guts to do anything like that now. But you, you see a band without a drummer, and you think, hmm. So sad. Maybe yeah, that's creating an opportunity. And I did that once at a dueling piano bar. <laughs> yeah. 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 And wow. the, bass, the bass player in that gig was a guy named uh, Doug Habana, and he ended up getting me a bunch of session work, uh, a bunch of local gigs, and he got me a gig with Shelby Lynn. I so agree. You, you never know. There's always that's another Nashville thing. There's no matter what gig you play, how crappy it is, there's always that one guy in the band who's good and who might be able to get you something in the future. Don't. Don't turn down anything because you never know who you're going to meet on that gig. Yeah. But to your credit, that that boldness, you know, I think they might have appreciated because, you know, like I said uh, before, I was in a p dueling piano bar in Cincinnati, Ohio, and um, my brother wanted to get up and play. So I think he played with them and they had a drum kit up there mm -hmm. and I was, you know, three sheets to the wind. I'm, I'm like, I'll die. I just walked right up, sat myself down. And these guys are looking at me like, oh, gosh, we got a drunk on the drums. And they're like, and he looks at me, he goes, I want to, you pick the song and make it obscure. And I looked right <laughs> back at him. And at the time I was listening to, uh, dream theaters, uh, second album. And it was like, um, a, a long 25 minute song that uh, was one of theirs. And on the flip side, it was a bunch of covers. One of them being funeral for a friend mm. uh, from Elton John. Yeah. It's a yeah. heavy one, man. Yeah. And I'm like, and I said, funeral for a friend. And the guy looked at me like, you're serious. I'm like, try it on, dude. Let's do it. And, and how did it go? From, I was fine because I, I knew it by memory. Nice. I listened to That's it. I listened cool. to the Dream Theater. Yeah. And it was just, uh, it was crazy. And, and or as I, they I call them, them for probably an hour and a half. Or as they call them in Tennessee, Dream Theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's kind of like how you play in seven in Tennessee. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> it was funny. Uh, they actually played uh Dream Theater played uh I don't know, two years ago, not at the Ryman, but at the uh, Opry House. Yeah. And uh James Labrie, you know, during one of the breaks looks around, he's like, Man, if these walls could talk about us, <laughs> and he says <laughs> There's too many notes. Yes. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So was that a, a piano bar on uh, on a on a riverboat on Covington, Kentucky side? 
Yeah. I want to say it was. Yeah. Was uh, yeah, Ricky Nye? Room. Was Ricky Nye playing piano? Oh, gosh. There? I have yeah. no idea. It was 1999 yeah, when I did been. that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. I don't so, know. That was. So you get here and immediately you just knew instinctually to take chances and pitch yourself. Were you still in your twenties? It's like you scream somebody that's in no, your 20s. I was in my thirties by the time yeah. I moved here. Yeah. Cause there's something but, very, it's like, you know, youth, you know, I remember being in the early twenties and doing things like that. And people would just be like rolling their eyes, but be like, he's got balls, man. Let's see what he's got. Yeah, you know? I know. Get a load of this guy over here. Yeah. Well, speaking of balls, man, I mean, uh, and you guys are you know, traditionalists going back to the Opry, the controversial thing that's happened recently with the Dolly Parton show and L King. What are your guys' thoughts on that? What happened? I, I'm out of the loop. Did you not hear about that? No, no. Uh, she might have been a little tipsy on stage and like she's the first one who's ever done that. Right. I'm sure there's still vomit stains from George Jones backstage at the Opry somewhere. I mean, it's yeah. not like... <laughs> It's not like oh, any other happened. artist didn't go, whoops, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that before I came on stage. But Yeah, she know. was plastered and uh, no. made no bones about it. Right, right. You know. uh, I'm not I'm not one to judge, but. Interesting. Interesting, because yeah. she, you know, is that's, you know, that's Rob Schneider's daughter. Did you know that, Jim? Right. Yeah. yeah, I did. So, and then she is, you know, she has really gotten herself a lot of hosting work. I mean, I don't, you know, I actually know. New Year's Eve. I know who her manager is. Uh, she used to be mm -hmm. our publicist. Um, and but basically, yeah, she has gotten some serious hosting gigs. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is I never good. heard of her until New Year's Eve when I saw her doing the hosting for that. She's good. She's a real good singer. Yeah, got mm -hmm. some good songs too. So, Rich, what was the first drum clinic you ever went to? Do you remember? Yeah, interesting. Um, first musical acts I saw were Buddy Rich, the Maynard Ferguson Big Band, and. Oh, yeah chuck berry with my drum teacher on drums because he hired local wow. bands right yeah, right right so i got to see my teacher ricky malachi el paso texas the el paso uh convention center you know sitting there just following chuck um first drum clinic um i saw joe english from oh yeah wings right taught everybody about a paradiddle at danny's music box and on in el paso texas and i got to see roy burns oh yeah um, i've been to some roy clinics yeah where he pulls Great up dude. and he's got a rental car and he pulls his bag of symbols out and it was like it's very cool um big ones did i see oh, i don't those i remember seeing those two in um in el paso texas yeah yeah uh what was your first uh trying to think i think it was larry london in 1977 wow in dearborn michigan and mm -hmm. i didn't know anything about country yeah and he's playing his butt off and telling stories about recording with jerry reed and jerry reed telling him i don't want no iron on this what i don't, I don't want no iron he didn't want him to play cymbals that's amazing iron. <laughs> no iron this and he'd, he'd also tell him uh I want this to uh, feel like a three-legged dog. So, ga -ding, ga -dang, ga -dang, da -da -ding, da -ding, was, yeah, I guess it's a you know some kind of uh, uh, shuffle, you know, where you're going doom, -doo, like a horse, got -doo, got -doo, yeah, so and Jim, all these things. And I'm going, oh my god, what crazy. is this? Yeah, J I mean, Jim was Larry great. was like Jim. Well, you're a we were a ferocious reader of modern drummer, but he had a great period of time here in Nashville where he did incredibly well, and he brought he brought the he was the he guy. He brought a pop sense, a pop rock sensibility, Yamaha recording customs, yeah. flubby snare drums, uh, D drums, triggered things, you know, uh, to the music. And yeah. uh, he, that's him on O'Sherry as well. Yeah, I know. Really? Yeah. 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 One time I was uh, I recording at a big studio in Cincinnati, fifth floor studio. And in the lobby, this was like probably in the mid 80s was uh, one of Larry London's Pearl kits, concert toms. It was basically like an octoplus, and it was set up in the lobby. I think he was recording with Adrian Ballou or somebody, and I, I was just, he was set up in the lobby, not in the studio, and the sound in there was amazing. And, and he had uh, clear emperors on all his single-headed toms. I'd never seen anyone do that because everyone was doing black dots, and they sounded wonderful. Yes. I wish I could have played him on the session, but I didn't touch him. But uh, he was a fantastic drummer, man. 
Yes, and crazy. just too premature. I mean, he actually died on stage doing a clinic at the University of North Texas. Oh, wow. Did he? Yeah, yeah Jim Rowley was there. Wow. Um, really? Yeah. He died wow. on stage at the university. Wow. Huh. I know. So, I remember when he died, but I don't remember that aspect. Yeah, of it. that's awful. It is. It was in the nineties, right? Early nineties. Yes. Yeah. Right, Max. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember they did a whole. They did. My modern drummer did a whole tribute to him and everything. I would think it was I like no a ninety-two, ninety-three, something around there. Yeah. I'll do my job and look it up. Hold on. You guys keep talking. Well, Max, I love. I love how you've approached your life and followed your dreams and created opportunities for yourself. Is there something that you have learned since 1989 that you would for sure share with someone moving to Nashville to chase their dreams, they wanting to do the thing? Well, uh, I used to work at a drum shop in Cincinnati and the owner there gave me some really wise advice after he had played a gig where the band guys were bickering with each other. And so this is the, his name was Walt Grau. Was this Steeple's drums? No, uh, this is sticks and stuff. It was sticks called sticks and stuff. Okay. Yeah. So Walt, the Walt Grau five second drum clinic, play the gig, keep your mouth shut, collect your money, go home. That's awesome. One more Don't time. Get in, play the gig, collect your money uh keep your mouth shut go home Love don't it. get involved in all the band bickering don't get drunk you know don't cause problems just keep it easy yes but the other thing uh, advice i would give drummers in nashville or moving to nashville is work on your train beat solos 95 percent of the time if a drummer gets a solo in Nashville, it's going to be on a train beat. Wow. You got to work up some ideas so you don't sound like an idiot. You know, work up some Max Roach licks or some Samba stuff or something kind of clever to do, but you got to kind of keep the train feel going. Oh, man. All the time. You're, go you're going in. Nah, I'm doing little, little. Okay, let's give the drummer some. You're going not on train beat. I don't know. So practice that. Well, you know what? That is that is advice, drumming advice gold. Because, you know, as a teacher, you know, I have these things where I have a day and people fly in, they spend a day with me, and we, we're, we, you know, I make sure that they can do their Motown beat and their soca and their samba and their partido alto and their reggae. And, and we get to the train beat, and there's just so many, it, it's eighth notes in the hands with an accent on two and four, with a loud bass drum on one and three, and a loud hi hat on two and four. And it, it is they're unbelievable it takes so much effort to get people to do it and then once they get it i'm like because i'm saying look at the the softest part of your hands the tap on the snare drum the ooga chaka is a ooh is with the loudest part of the bass drum so you got the softest part of your hands with the if you want to deconstruct it like that some people right. are just natural they just come in they got dooga chaka dooga they, they got it the, and the, the limbs uh, are balanced. and the un unaccented notes need to be really low very low they can't be you can't be like doing forte and then fortissimo for the accent it's got to be really low and you should practice it at all different volumes because sometimes you got to play it real quiet practice it with brushes different tempos do you always just play it hand to hand um well i'll show them that you can do it um mama data you know yeah right right left yeah. right right left i see left. some guys do it like that but for the most part, I really like the flexibility and the control, and I think it helps your internalize the feel and the time, whether it's straight or swung, no matter what, with the hand-to-hand. -hand. Right. But the main thing that separates everyone, and this is just, I think, a skill that is going to, is drumming in a nutshell, is if drumming comes down to two things, accented notes and unaccented notes, and 90% of people play unaccented notes too loud so right. they sound self-taught we wouldn't have david garibaldi if he didn't have the grace notes so graceful master at that they're yeah. just barely above the head yeah so that's the key man you're right you know like drum solo well just start with some some syncopation 
Or just break out some paradiddles or something. Do it. You go to the rim, go to a cowbell, go to the yeah. floor, Tom, for Krupa. Yeah. Play some little melodies. Watch uh, Charlie Adams drum solo from Yanni Live at the Acropolis. Does he go to a train beat? He does a train nice, beat. Nice. It's part of his solo. I think Charlie's still here. Yeah. In Nashville. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jim, uh, as far as Larry asked, London. Pal. Yeah. That's why I was, I was just going to chime in with that. But uh, 1992 suffered a myocardial infarction. Wow. Heart attack. That early. That's awful. Collapsed during a drum clinic at the University of North Texas. He was comatose for four months and then died at the age at my age at 48. Wow. In Nashville. I'm just oh. trying to live long enough to keep playing and keep enjoying it and doing things to keep my body working correctly. Well, you're a biker, aren't you? Do you get on the bike? I do a lot of bike riding. That's really good for my knees. I've had knee problems. I had back surgery like 23 years ago. Oh, wow. That was mm. difficult. After that, I started doing a lot of yoga. Really helps stretching. You, you do know, grounding? Before and after. Pardon? You try grounding? Grounding? That's where the know. crazy kids take their bare feet and they get on the grass. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one yeah. way to do it. And yeah, you're going to yeah. think I, it sounds kooky, but. No, it's, uh, I, uh, I get it. There was, I actually bought uh, a grounding blanket and I've been Ooh, sleeping yeah. with it for the past two months. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, I was going down the stairs and I'm, I, I realized I'm like, wow, I have like no aches or pain. Wow. <laughs> just what makes it a grounding blanket, buddy? It plugs into the wall socket, into the ground portion of the wall socket. So it's electronic. I, I, I kid you not. Yeah. Huh. It's a, it's electronic because I mean the, every socket in your house, the ground, the you know, it looks like a face, right? It's got the right. little hole in the bottom, right. the hole in the bottom, the mouth, if you will. That's directly to the ground rod in your house that uh, grounds the whole house. Holy yeah. cow! You didn't some, know that? Some really smart inventor right there. But yeah, there's a reason I mean, why they call it a ground. Interesting. Because so okay so, so Max you're you're you know you're uh you're stretching you're doing yoga you're biking um what about the diet do you restrict things are you serious absolutely you, yeah yeah uh very very low carbs kind of a Mediterranean diet with low carbs I quit too, sugar oh several years ago and that made a a huge difference too made you, a lot of difference how do you I, quit quit sugar so like never ever ever well, are you going to put very, a green I, I did your... quit it completely for a couple of years and i gradually added a little bit back but nice. i never eat uh sweets or anything like that that's it's nice. gotta be I, sugar free or something like that yeah, i love that now i can't say that i i it will makes, go it makes a big difference yeah the first two weeks is hard but after that you don't really miss it too much what about nice. uh good old almonds Sure. Oh, almonds are very good. Yeah. Yeah, I like almond. Yeah, man. Mediterranean diet, low carb, uh, emphasis on uh, no sugar. I love that. What, what about the um, red wine, martinis, old fashions? Are, are, you, are you off the Not booth? much of a drinker. Never on the gig. That's good for you. Just, I played in several bands here in Nashville where everybody's either in the program or just don't drink on the gig yes it makes it harder for me no. it's like adds a degree of difficulty especially sure. when you have to pack up your own stuff at the end of the night that's how you lose stuff <laughs> or leave leave a guitar on in front of a club and forget about it <laughs> well and 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 it'll take your whole paycheck if you're not careful yeah. you know it's yeah. Like, yeah yeah so yeah i've had real bad knee problems on my right knee. I actually had to quit playing with my right leg for a while, a few oh, years ago. Oh, wow. And got a double pedal and just started playing with my left foot. Did that Did for not a know while. that. Have I yeah. seen you play down at Tootsie's with the left foot? I doubt. At Roberts, yeah. Uh, like maybe. Roberts. you pro Yeah, every time, probably in the last several years I've been playing there, I uh, do some songs. Some of the easier stuff I'll do left. It's a lot better now. I've rehabbed it, ice it down a lot. Yeah. The biking really helps. So now I kind of I kind of try split. the grounding blanket. Yeah. Yeah. It might now make a big I, difference. I try to split the load between my right and my left foot. I don't do any fancy double bass licks, but just kind of like right, left, right, left, doing doing that like on shuffle tunes or something. Or lead with the left and put the in between notes on the right. But it, it really helps. 
Wow. It really helps a posture too. It really helps my posture because um, it's more ergonomic. Right? Yes. Instead I of forget. loading up, loading up the right, you know, the right, the right side of your body. And I see some guys that are like leaning over here playing and just, it looks so uncomfortable. Just try to keep your posture good. Be aware of that. Yeah. Hearing protection. Uh, very important. I see too. the guys uh, who sit really high. Like, you know, to me, it makes sense to keep your, your thighs parallel to the ground, right? That's That should be, that's my ideal seating position. But right. I see like a guy like Portnoy, he sits like he's sitting on a bar stool. Way up high. Oh, I saw gosh, Elvin he, Jones once and he was uh, sitting so high and his posture was perfect until the day yeah. he died. He wow. was, he sits very high. Some guys can do that. Tony Williams. And then you see the... And then you see the guys that sit really low where their knees are higher than their hips. I'm like, oh, oh my Tommy gosh. Yeah. yeah. I, I think most of those guys end up raising their seat as they get older. I'm yeah. just guessing. <laughs> like Vinny. Vinny Caliuta did that. He used to sit really low when he was with Frank Zappa. Just so ridiculously low. low. Ridiculous. Incredibly low. Like saw saw the saw the legs off the seat almost. Yeah. Low. But yeah, I'm, I sit low. I don't think it's good for me, but uh, you look you know, comfortable, though. I mean, oh well, thanks. No, your 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 thighs are parallel to the ground. I've noticed that. Yeah. Oh, thank you for and noticing. I've sat my behind thighs. your. I mean, your seating height is comparable to mine. Yeah. So yeah, I don't think you sit low. Yeah, the only guy that can really seem to get away with incredibly bad posture is like when you see Gad. He's like slumps over, but it sounds so amazing. Buddy Rich's posture was horrible. Oh, it, was, it was horrible. horrible. Was Pierce' horrible. posture was horrible. Neil yeah. Peart was bad too. Oh, yeah. Neil yeah. Yeah. Al Sorry. Alex Van Halen was bad. Are you he still out over. doing clinics, uh, Rich? Yeah, I'm trying. I, I would say Are the like, drum you clinic know, still a thing. Me and Jim Riley and Mark Schulman and Kenny, we're trying to stand and more. We're trying to keep it alive. You know what yeah. I mean? And there's there's no reason to not. Todd Zuckerman is really doing the best because he, you know, he basically he'll do he'll do two three master classes in two or three cities a week. Um. And we've had to change the business model a little bit because the companies would all add into the pod to make it a nice payday right. for the artist. That's how it used and to be. And then COVID killed that. And so now you just got to go find the true believers that mm. want to, you know, just treat their little drumming community to, to a, you know, a community event. And they see it as uh, kind of like a grassroots marketing. And there are those right. people, out, they just strip, boom, they just come out of pocket to pay for it and then the other model is is doing a master class model and you know you talk to your host and i find out hey is this a hundred dollars for two hours market <laughs> or is this a hundred and fifty dollars and you know what i mean because right. economically what's going to get the people out of their houses you know so the fact that it's like 20 people would pay 150 dollars on a tuesday night and come out of their houses like in the rain it happens it's crazy you know right. what I mean? It really is. But no, I like it because, you know, idle time on the road is the devil's playground. So I like to be so busy. I like to get my workouts, go teach, and then I do the sound check, and then I break bread with my band, and then it's time to do the thing. And oh, then so you try to book like a clinic in the afternoon of where you have a gig at night. I do it in the morning. Oh yeah. man, that's cool. Yeah, that's I've great. But doing that for fifteen years, man, wow. and now it's it's really cool because it gets to the point where. You know, in the early days, it was like, hi, my name's Rich Redmond. I'm going to be in town. And you have to sell people really hard. And then now you get the phone call. Hey, you're going to be at the such and such center in August. Do you want to do a thing? And so they call you, which is like, ah, that's oh, good, it only man. took 15 years. Well, yeah. that uh, cuts out the transportation costs. Costs That used to be a big thing for clinicians. You know, yes. you got to fly them in or whatever. That was a big big part of the experience you have to buy their exact kit there was so much money yeah. back in the day like the velvet yeah. rope era of the music business i can't even believe it it's like it's like look at man i'm already there can you just get one of your employees to pick me up <clears> and drop me off i'll set up my own kit da 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 it, you just white glove it so they can't say no right you know when, when well, i, I mean, was uh, when i was in, in, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> they we haven't perfected the zoom thing yeah, um, it would be curious to see why these manufacturers didn't feed into that. Because, I mean, when I used to go to clinics, it actually fired me up to buy the stuff. You know, I saw Greg Bissonnette right. at East Coast Music Mall in Danbury, Connecticut. Sure. <clears throat> and I wanted Zildjian cymbals and pearl drums just like he did. Yeah. You know, that was, it fired me up for him. So why wouldn't they keep on feeding this? 
Greg did a clinic. It's got to uh, be a low. Greg Bissonette did a clinic at a drum store I was working at in Cincinnati. And mm -hmm. his clinic was great. I got to take about an hour or two hour lesson with him. Nice. And he was a great teacher, really honed in on what I was kind of things that I was kind of working on and just really gave me a lot of shortcuts. And, Let me guess, uh, early 90s? This would have been the 80s. Oh, really? Okay. This might have been, you know. Around David Lee Roth. The, yeah, yeah, maybe right before all that hit. Maybe I saw. Yeah. I think I might have saw him yeah. in '90 then. Yeah, so he was playing with like 90. Maynard Ferguson and Tanya Maria. Tanya and Maria, yeah. session work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was great. He had everything organized. He had handouts and everything where he had all this stuff written out. He'd play along with tracks. He had the the model down really good. He's very natural, early. natural, natural yeah. clinician. Um, Speaking of drummers and influences, who would who is your Mount Rushmore of drummers? Ah, uh, Philly Joe Jones. Okay, Max Roach. Philly Max, Art Blakey. All right, mm -hmm. and then of course you get into you know Steve Gadd, people like that, John Robinson. Yes, but early on it was uh, probably Mitch Mitchell and uh, Ginger Baker. John Bonham, of course. Uh, Bobby Columbi with Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Tears. Yeah. Have you ever interviewed him? He'd be a good interview. No, my God, Lucretia McEvil. Fantastic oh. drummer, and he quit the music business to be an A and R guy at Columbia Records. That's right. Interesting oh, wow. story. Great totally. drummer, though. Fantastic drummer. Oh, those Blood, Sweat, and Tears records, incredible. Yeah. Early jazz rock. Yeah. Just commercial stuff he jazz was playing rock. Was yeah. Stuff I mean, he they, was playing was up amazing they had commercial success man yeah yeah incredible well hey um i love the fact that we have a theme for this episode and it's all about creating opportunities and making your life going after it we're gonna end with the fave five and what is your favorite color favorite color would be uh green that's my second green in a row today. I just interviewed Neil Grover, the principal percussionist from the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and he gave me green. All Maybe right. Maybe it's because of this bleak weather. We're all thinking of green. God, I hate this weather. <laughs> I mean, Jim and Jim's like tired of hearing me go like, we live in Birmingham, England, but it is <laughs> it is so uninspiring. Yeah, it could be worse. It could be, Jim. We could be in a post-apocalyptic land. Um, could be Maybe Connecticut. Drew favorite drink <laughs> favorite drink uh probably just white wine Ooh, something pinky. wimpy like that you know oh pinkies out like a chardonnay and a salad you always uh, know the... not with a pinky out i, okay. I prefer it in a dirty glass yeah and you like it chilled or no yeah chilled you yeah. gotta chill it okay i like you that. gotta chill white wine what's your favorite uh food or dish favorite food would probably be grilled salmon eat a okay. lot of that I like that. Okay, oh, you know, are you on, are you on like a, a outside grill, a foreman grill? What do you? No, you I can just do it inside. Nice. Yeah, now, salmon's a big part. I don't. I don't even haven't eaten red meat in a long time, so I eat a lot of fish, a lot of salmon. You know what? I'm on this thing where like, oh, I celebrate my omega threes and my omega sixes. I will get into that, but I've I've been really on the paleo kick, and I will eat eggs three eggs a day i'll have a steak i and you know what i've never been in better shape really i eat the no. meat man yeah you know you just i just got to stay away from the refined rice and, and tortillas right. and the white bread. rice is not good yeah it is not it is not how about your favorite song is there a song that you hear on the radio boom you're cranking it Ooh. Uh, that's a tough one. It is. I, I, maybe I got to remove that as a question because everyone's like, how just one? How can it just yeah, be how one? how can I write it to run? Uh, uh, I don't know. It's something I'd hear on the radio. It might be, you know, some old George Benson stuff or something like that, you know. Uh, yeah. Is there a current uh, flavor of the week? Some stuff. Yeah. yeah, I was just listening to some of George Benson from the seventies with Harvey Mason, Mason on it, playing yeah. single headed toms. Yes. Man, that stuff, you hear that stuff. And and later on, you know, the other albums where John Robinson played, Gad played on some of his stuff. Yeah, so man. That's always good for just listening, going, Oh yeah, that was really good. Hmm. S uh single headed toms are coming back. They're I, coming they back. They, they have a thing, man. Aren't they concert toms? They have much? a thing. Concert toms, yeah. 
But if I had to pick one song, it'd probably be like uh, Babylon Sisters, Steely Dan. Oh, my God. You can't beat that, man. And if you get that down and you just muscle it up a little bit, you're playing Fool in the Rain. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what about those songs? Steely Dan and uh, Led Zeppelin would throw you off in radio because they have two songs that could easily be mispronounced. Oh, which one is what would be on the surface? You'd read it as Dire Maker. Right. Which is Deer Maker. Deer Maker. And Steely Dan would be uh, Aja. Which Asia. I had to be corrected on, you know. Is it Asia, Asia. or Aja? Aja. Asia. Right? Yeah, it's Asia. Asia. It's Asia. Asia. But I would, you know, I back sell. So it's Aja from Steely Dan. Oh you no! Know, you know, you're giving me Aja. You're giving yeah. me Aja. <laughs> you saying it that way is giving me Aja. <laughs> <laughs> Final favorite. Your favorite movie. You have a favorite film? Something that you celebrate? You love to watch? Ooh. Uh... Ooh, that's a tough but even one. TV show too. I mean, if it's a TV show, uh, I loved Breaking Bad. That's got to be up mm. there all time, dude. Did you rewatch it? Oh yeah, yeah, we did yeah. too. What's your what's the, like a good show that you like? They're old friends that you want to go back and just put it on in the background, and it's like you know hanging out with old buddies in a way. Um, yeah. probably Seinfeld or. Yeah. Uh, Perry Mason, the old black and white Perry ooh, Mason from nice. the sixties. Ah. Talk about sharp suits, sharp cars. Yeah. Man, that was a that was a stuff back then, dude. Man, <laughs> um, yeah. I got to tell you, I'm that guy. And there's going to be some listeners that are going to roll their eyes because you, Friends, man, Friends holds up to the. It's like it was shot yesterday. I mean, yeah. everybody's I would agree. so fun and friendly the writing is incredible the way that those actors hit their lines and put the emphasis on the different syllables that take it to a really special place you know and the girls wearing these cutting edge fashions and they were you know not ugly it was i yeah. love it we watch a good three episodes a night you know really hate really? to admit yeah. hate to admit never, that that never grabbed me i don't know why ah. i don't know see i'm that guy they're like oh redmond of course he likes friends my wife just put on, uh, you remember the show Rescue Me? Yeah. Leary? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great just, show. Yeah. That, we started watching that again. Uh, she put it on this morning. I'm like, oh, yeah, I forgot about this show. Dennis Leary. For me, for me, it's The Office always. I can go back to The Office, office and is laugh, great. man. My yeah. Brother. Even but, the British one, too. But the, the British American one, to me, it, it, yeah. I mean, the British one is like the first couple of episodes. I think it just got really obscure on the British I, one. I, to me. Unfortunately, I saw the American one before I saw the British one. So a lot yeah, of people so that fall in love with the British one don't like the American one as much. But yeah, yeah. Do you guys remember Faulty Towers? It ran for like two seasons, I think, with John oh, yeah. Cleese. Yeah, yeah, no. incredible. Oh, it's, it was a it was a BBC sitcom with John Cleese, and uh, quite hilarious. And really? Monty Python stuff too. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. you ever seen uh, Absolutely Fabulous? It's another yeah. BBC show. I watched my first two episodes the other day. It was basically just just a bunch of drunk women. I have to have closed captioning on because I cannot understand what they're saying. <laughs> it's, the accent is, is really thick and they're drunk half the time and mumbling. Yeah. yeah. I need closed captioning in general just to watch anything. <laughs> We we we're, we're watching Brothers Son right now. It's Gwyneth Paltrow's husband wrote the wrote the series. It's an eight episode series. It's on Netflix and it's really enjoyable because it's a total like a lot of things now. It's a genre blend. It's like the old Bruce Lee kung fu stuff, um, and then a serious drama and then some dark comedy. So it's oh, like yeah. kung fu dark dramedy. It's great. Yeah, cool. Really? It's really All it's right. really good brother's son everyone check it out max i can't tell you how exciting this was it was so fun to see you well, it's great to talk with you man we never did you know, to like do long talks or anything well, dude, like 25 that, years i've been here i know and i mean you're always in the back of my mind as far as like hey who are you know who who makes up the fabric of nashville i mean you're in there buddy you know i'm one of the threads of the fabric in nashville you're in the th yeah, dude. You're a cog in the wheel, and it takes all of us Maybe to make a the thing thread. go around. <laughs> I love Somebody's it, man. Somebody's pulling on it somewhere. 
Hey, so how do you do you like to be found on the interwebs? What's the best place for people to find you? Ah, uh, yes. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. It's Maxwell underscore Schaff, S C H A U F. Nice. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but I, I have a, another Instagram account. It's vintage.drum.catalogs. I, I have follow a, you. That's a him. huge collection of vintage drum catalogs. Oh, dude. I've been. I've Talk never told anybody lane. that it's me doing that, but I, I, I can. I just started something. I started during COVID. I had uh, a few catalogs. I used to have them all, and I just started collecting them again during COVID and posting them just because I enjoy it. The secret is out. Max is the guy behind this, and I tell you what. The other day, I screenshotted your post and I sent it to a friend of mine because we love. 80s yamaha drums i've got and it a was bunch big, of 80s it was stuff. the big spread with the double bass and oh. all the the green trigger pads all the, the symbol pa the symbol arms coming you know five yes. sections yeah that was the centerfold the, man the i mean forget playboy centerfolds yeah you that. know give me give me give me drum catalog centerfolds anytime yeah. yeah yeah but i mean it's it's so funny talk about going down memory lane with some of these things but even the ridiculous setups that they would come up with. i know don't you love it though Oh God! I had a a huge Gretsch kit in the in the eighties, just toms and cymbals everywhere. Those were the days, man. Finish dot to, drum dot catalogs. I used oh, to yeah. stare. At, I used to stare at that catalog. For yeah, hours. Yeah, man. Dreaming about. Getting I kind of started drums. with uh, drum catalogs in the sixties. That's when it kind of bit me. But some of those eighties catalogs are. The best. Where are you getting the? Are you? Do you actually have these catalogs? I own that. Everything I post, I own. Look at you. So I've got what a great a whole idea. Big file cabinet full of uh, drum catalogs. I I bought them on Reverb and bought them on uh, eBay. I don't pay too much for them. You know, I I don't. Wow. They don't have to Rich. be the pristine yeah. condition or anything. Jim is showing me a picture. There, there it is. Go, Jim is showing me the picture of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine toms, double bass, a beautiful six and a half snare drum, 20 cymbals, trigger pads. It's the Yamaha centerfold. It's probably yeah. it was like 1983. A 87, I think it was. I think it says and on there. The yeah. cymbal stands that, you know, you hang them from, you're suspending them from the top. Yeah, multiple like dog mul legs. Multiple knuckles. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> who sets Crazy. this up? I mean, that stuff was set up just for, you know, oh, just yeah. for a to show off their yeah. sexy factor. Somewhere yeah. somebody bought that, though. I'm sure. No, somebody, absolutely. That had, you know, $20,000 just laying around. Yeah. Yeah. I had the, it, the, the cherry red uh, Philippine mahogany stage customs, cherry oh, red, yeah. 1984. Five. Those were those Dude, were nice, man. Those are good drums. You are like yeah. tapping into such nostalgia. With I had we had no idea you did this, but I good mean, good job, man. Well, the cat's out. Holy moly! What a scoop. secrets out now. Yeah, yeah. I love. You've it. never it's, it's, revealed it's this to anybody. So, no. Wow. I uh, you got a scoop. Yeah, that is a scoop. Thank I, you. I've told a couple. You know, it's a couple friends of mine know that yeah. I do it, but uh, yeah, it's just fun for me. And I, I really like the old 50s and 60s catalog, but I don't get much action on those. You know, people like the 80s and 90s stuff. That's fine. I just kind of do a variety, whatever I feel like posting that day. I've kind of posted it everything already. So I'm kind of just going back and reposting some of it. Some of it I'm uh, rescanning or rephotographing because I have better gear now to do that. Nice. Right. Well, it's even fun. going going back into the classic photos of the old modern drummers. I mean, you've got oh this yeah, one, got I got Al tons Blaine. of old modern drummers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those that oh, picture yeah. right there, yeah, is such a classic one. Those it's an fiberglass Blameyer Tom shells. Yeah. yeah, I used to see that picture and like, man, well, how how much fun would that kid be to play? It was this one actually. He was looking up at the camera. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a classic one. He had three of those that moved all across Los Angeles, and they were all kit number one. Kit Did you hear that? So, so all the he producers want kept wanting to uh, kit number one, and so he uh, stenciled kit number one on all of his kits. Oh my god, <laughs> that is smart. That's like the they were all the same. That's but, like the Leland Scar volume trick. Oh on yeah, the, base. the producer yeah. volume knob. Hey, yeah, I, I got I got to brag on this. This came in the mail. I wanted to buy it because it's a piece of musical history. But Leland Sklar's "Everybody oh, Loves Me." Oh man. And it's 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 this. Look at how thick this book is. It's man, that's thousands killer. of photos of people 
flipping off Leland. And somehow one afternoon I was doing a rock and roll fantasy camp thing. And I got to hang out with John Robinson, Hal Blaine, Keltner, Kunkel. And, and yeah. we all flipped off. Oh, that's great, man. <laughs> we all flipped off Leland Sklar. Oh, I love it. So everybody great. go get this book. Everybody loves me. It's uh it's not cheap. It's about 45 bucks, but it's it's kind of like a it's kind of like a soft hardback and it looks amazing and Jeff Bezos will deliver yeah. it right to your front door. Um just like this book, Making It in Country Music and Insiders Look at the Industry that took me my entire <laughs> life to write, but really just one year. So give us there a nice five-star rating there, guys. We know about country music, right, Max? We survived it. We survived it. We We're did. We're still here. Hey, man. Uh, to all the listeners, do yourself a favor. If you're in Nashville, if you live in Nashville, go see Max play at Robert's Western World with Brazil Billy. Go up and say hello to him. Give him a hug. Thanks for doing no, this, man. Just don't bother me. <laughs> no i'm kidding yeah. i'd love to meet anybody yeah <laughs> oh my god yeah offer uh, yeah. offer to buy him a cup of coffee like yeah you know. there you go yeah all right jim do you have a good time yeah man i I, I, I can't believe you're the guy behind Vita. I'm he's staring at the catalogs these, oh yeah. dude i'm I'm yeah. salivating right this is like memory lane for me that's incredible well this I'll was a great time like, i'll let you see him in person sometime if you're That'd, a good boy eric carr i used, oh. to, I used to have that hanging on oh, my yeah. wall really picture. Another yeah. classic one, yeah. That, that drum kit, my gosh! You had like Beautiful. pretty much bass drums for Tom's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they were hey, very deep. I bet Max has got a gig; he's probably got to get to, or he's got to grill up some salmon. So we're gonna let you go, man. Thank you so much for your time. All right, talent, Rich. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having having me on here, man. It's always Brother, good talking to you. So awesome, creating opportunities. I'm gonna drop by and see you play real soon, Jim. Thank you for your time, and tell Jim McCarthy Voiceovers.com. Reach out to Max, go see him play, and to all the listeners, thank you so much for the support. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, review. Seriously, it helps people find the show. Max, thanks so much. We'll see you next time, man. All right. Thanks. Take care, Rich. Thanks, pal. See you guys. Thanks, bud. I can't believe that, buddy. Oh, my yeah. gosh. That oh, was great. Hopefully you enjoyed how yourself. You, here's the thing, buddy. It's like, how do you... There's got to be a way to monetize this. This is not a... An well, audience see, that's what at. I'm thinking. I'm, e I'm either thinking of... Uh, I mean, <clears> I got uh, over 29,000 followers. Yeah, I don't know. I know. I, I'm toying with the idea of just selling and the whole thing. And they're engaged. Yeah, because there there's twenty nine thousand drummers there. That's yeah. got to be worth some money to somebody. I just sell the whole list to somebody. I'm thinking. Well, I'm wondering if you could actually do uh, reprints of this and maybe kind of stylize them, maybe laminate them or something. And you know, if, if people want to buy them, maybe that's mm -hmm. the the play. Oh, that's you know. That's you could also bundle it up like Leland Sklar into a hardback book. But how does it work with like? Is it intellectual Copyright. property that's owned by yeah. the companies? That's a that's a that's a good question. Yeah, that's no. probably I don't know. Who knows? It's so old. Some of it might be you in public, see public domain, domain. domain. By now. Yeah. Well, that'd be a big big legal question to ask a lawyer. But it, I think just blowing it out to some fat cat, like a mm -hmm. lawyer or somebody that's got the cash. Yeah. So yeah, I've, to here. I've toyed with that. Yeah, yeah, I've toyed with that. So. You got any It'll great come, ideas? Run it by me. Yeah, it'll come to me. So I'll you, have an aha moment. You've got two drum books out, right, Rich? <clears throat> yeah, uh, there's a one for kids. Fundamentals. I know that was kids. the first one, right? And that, yeah, and then I wrote a kind of like a, a motivational book Rich. called Crash Course for Success. Ah, cool, man. And then I did the voiceover on Audible. It's actually a free offering. If you subscribe to Audible, you can get Crash Course for Success and have me read it to you on your bike ride. All right. I <laughs> never wear headphones on the bike ride. You got to use your ears. You got man. to hear the traffic and yeah. stuff. That's why you're still alive. Um, yeah. All right, buddy. Love you. Thanks so all much. All right. Man. Thanks, Rich. See you guys. Thanks, Jim. Take care, man. Good to meet you. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.